It's at 3 o'clock, she's usually my nap time. So it's good for me to get up and move around a little bit. Thank you all for having me in your community. I have been teaching stress and trauma for 18 years. I've been a social worker for 20. So for 18 of 20 years as a social worker, I've been working in the area of stress and trauma and challenging behaviors. And I have consulted at schools and residential treatment facilities and group homes and just different organizations around the world. And, and let me tell you, I have yet until I met Dr. Bridgewater came across a community that was committed to being trauma informed. And that is an amazing, amazing thing. So I wanna just commend all of you, Vernon County Task Force, Healthy Nevada, and Cerner for being behind such a significant important movement. And if, if you don't really work in the field, if you don't understand um, you know, day in and day out, kind of the challenges around mental health and, and working with challenging children and stressed out families, then you can't quite comprehend the, the importance of a, a group of people that are committed to educating and informing an entire community. And I know you all are, have just experienced a, a tragedy in your community. And I, I have to tell you that God works in mysterious ways. And you never know just what can happen, what catalyst, what fires can be lit behind something is as serious and as sensitive as one of God's children being hurt. It's like a call to action for us to really look deep within ourselves and say to ourselves, we truly have to do something different. And so I just feel like an event like that in a group like this, I feel like you guys are just positioned and poised to do something really amazing. Last year, I had the opportunity to go present to a social services group in Michigan, I believe that's where, far, far out in Michigan or, or is Wisconsin. And the whole social services agency is working on being trauma informed. So that, that's just an amazing thing to me because we live in a traumatized society and we don't realize it. We throw around this word trauma informed and, and, and I'm gonna get into that. I've only got a couple of hours with you. So I gotta condense 18 years of information into two, into two hours and we're gonna do that. And your head's probably gonna hurt afterwards. So these are our goals for today. Our goals are to know what it means to be trauma informed. So I want you to know what it means to be trauma informed. I want you to become trauma sensitive. See, there are two different ways of looking at that. One, trauma informed is, is having the information. Being trauma sensitive is the next level. That's actually being aware of it. So I want to be able to provide that with you and, and share that with you. And then do what trauma sensitive does. So I want to just support you and encourage you and move you forward and inspire you to do what trauma sensitive and trauma informed does. And then we want to let every freaking person we know know about it follow us on Post Institute. I'm actually streaming live right now. And this is one of those situations in class where the teacher actually says, if you got a cell phone, open it up, open up Facebook, friend us on Post Institute and let your people know if I say something that's important to you today, if I say something that moves you, put it in there and let them know. Because the only way that we change the world is if we let people know what's going on and we get people to start thinking differently. So we want to talk about seeing through a trauma lens. And this is important because we have a, a paradigm. Our paradigm, I'm always talking about paradigms. Paradigms are the way in which you see the world. But the problem with the paradigm through which we've been viewing our, our relationships and which we've been viewing our children and our schools and our society is that it's based on generations and generations of false assumptions, misconceptions, prejudices, and all other kinds of negative fear-based things. And so if we wanna really do something different in this field, then we've gotta change the lens through which we look through. And what's important about that is that lens starts with you and I. It starts within us. See, a lot of times we wanna talk about the way trauma has impacted children. We wanna talk about the way trauma has impacted the, the adults that we work with or the the, uh, the families that we know or the people that were in New York at the World Trade Center or in, at the Murrah Building in, in Oklahoma City. We want to talk about those kind of traumas, but trauma starts with all of us. 
All of us. It all starts within us. And I like to say that before you can understand something in someone else, you have to understand it within yourself. So I want to encourage you to look within yourself as I'm sharing this with you. And the first thing, the first place we want to start is what is trauma? What is trauma? I don't want you to just, you know, hear the word trauma because as soon as we hear the word trauma, we all have an association for what that is. And your association for what that is is extremely limited to the reality of what trauma truly is. Trauma is any stressful event, any stressful event. Now think about that. Think about how many events you experience in your life that are stressful. (laughs) There are numerous, there's countless, there's an infinite number. Any stressful event which is prolonged, overwhelming, or unpredictable. Any stressful event which is prolonged, overwhelming, or unpredictable. And when that event continues on, and you've not been able to cry about it, scream about it, talk about it over and over and over, and then make sense of it, That's the difference between a short-term stressful experience and a long-term, potentially life-altering, traumatic experience. If you don't have an opportunity, if you experience something that is unpredictable, prolonged, and overwhelming, and you don't have an opportunity to cry about it, talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, and then understand it, that experience could impact you for the rest of your life. I remember one year I was given a lecture in New Orleans at a drug and alcohol national conference, and I started talking about trauma, and I may have used this definition or something or another, but at the lunch break, a lady comes up to me and she says, I have got to tell you something. You have just saved my life. She said, ever since I was a little girl, I have been terrified by birds, terrified. She said, just the other day, I was in my car, I got in my car and a bird flew down on the hood of my car and I froze. I could not move. And I said, bird, please get off my car. And she said, the bird finally flew away and I was able to drive to work. She said, you just helped me to remember that when I was five years old, I was in the backyard with my sister and a chicken attacked us. Every since that time, I have been terrified by birds and I didn't know why. Now, how many of us would remember an experience like that on a conscious level that had occurred at five? We wouldn't. That's called being vastly unconscious. Trauma gets stored in the part of your brain, which is vastly unconscious. It gets stored in the same part of your brain as your personality traits. And so you don't remember. You don't remember. And it goes back even further than that. Trauma could start at conception. Those are the pre-verbal agents, the pre-verbal stage of development. When you don't have any words, all you have is, is memories. As early as the fourth week after conception, the fetus is capable of hearing. As early as the second trimester, the fetus is capable of psychological processing. Before you even come into the world, you could have experienced some kind of trauma, domestic violence, drug and alcohol exposure, rape, the loss of a a significant uh, caregiver or spouse. I worked with a little girl when she was 13 years old. Her grandmother was raising her. And in the process of working with her, it came out that when the little girl was a baby, they had gotten hit by a car and the father was decapitated. And that child had the most difficult time getting in a car. It would drive the grandma crazy because she would take so long to get in the car. And once we came to that understanding, It was just a matter of communicating to this little girl and sharing with her and getting her to open up and to be sad and to grieve the loss of her father and the fear of getting in cars. That's pre-verbal. She didn't even remember that. She was a baby. But trauma has that kind of impact on your brain. So you have to realize that trauma is any stressful event, any stressful event which is prolonged, overwhelming, or unpredictable. And if you don't get a chance, like those kids at that school right now, they've got to talk about it. Those teachers at that school, those parents of that child, 
the family members, other community members, they've got to talk about it. And see, the problem is, is they start talking about it and they talk about it three months from now. They want to talk about it and we don't want to hear it anymore because it's too emotional. But they've got to talk about it and then they've got to cry about it. I was thinking about this on the drive down here. Those children need to be set in a group and they need an adult to lead some crying. They need an adult who says it is okay to be sad. It is okay to be sad and scared and mad. And give those children an opportunity to express themselves. And to let it out. Because without that, they just shove it in. They just shove it in. Stephen Covey said, upset feelings never die. They are buried alive and come back as something ugly. Bruce Lipton says, 98% of disease and disorder is related to stress in the autonomic nervous system. 98%. Connected to stress. Now here are other common traumatic events. See, this is, this is where we start to go astray. Because these are the traumatic events that we think about. These are traumatic events that we see every day. Well, if you're in, if you're in the mental health profession or social work or a school counselor. Abuse, neglect, adoption and foster care. This is adoption, national adoption mom. Frequent moves, chronic pain. You could be in chronic pain right now and not realize that you are literally living in a state of trauma. We have a, we have a national opioid epidemic, don't we? These people didn't just wake up one day and think I'm going to pop a few Oxycontin. They were in pain, whether it was physical pain or emotional pain, they were in pain. And that stress, pain is stress. And stress can damage your brain and it can damage your body. Emotional absence. I was talking to Johannes this morning, and, and we were talking about some of the common forms of trauma and the uncommon forms of trauma. Most of us don't even realize that emotional absence is the most pervasive form of trauma in our society. You know what emotional absence is? It's a depressed parent. It's a parent who works hard all day long, comes home and can't do anything except watch the news and cook food and then go to bed. That's an emotionally absent the parent. Parent, you know what that parent communicates? On an unconscious, on a physiologic level, that parent communicates stress because emotional absence is the same physiology as stress. Tiffany Fields is a researcher at the University of Miami. She did this study with infants. She took two infants. She hooked one infant up to a brain scan, and this, this infant had a, had a healthy parent. She hooked another infant up to a brain scan, this infant had a depressed parent. The monitors of the infants looked exactly the same when the healthy parent got up and walked away from her baby in comparison to when the depressed parent walked toward her baby. You see that? That's stress communication. That's emotional absence. But you know, we don't talk a lot about emotional absence. Because scientists say if you can't see it, it doesn't exist. But emotional absence is the most common form of trauma in our society. Some of us have grown up in emotionally absent, stressed out homes. Parental depression and then needs left unmet. These are common. These are the common traumatic events. What about these? Some additional ones. Now, these are traumatic events we don't always think about day to day. That could have occurred at any point in your childhood. See, I want you to understand how trauma affected you, you as the adults. I want you to understand the impact stress has had in your life. In your life, first and foremost, because when you understand the impact the stress has had in your life and potentially the trauma and the impact it's had in your life, then you can begin to understand what the child is going through and what the child is dealing with. Because if you just connect to how that experience made you feel, and you can still do that right now to this day, right now in this moment, you can still connect to how that experience made you feel. You close your eyes, you take some deep breaths, you slow your thinking down, and you think about that experience, and you just ask yourself, how did that make me feel? Because it hasn't gone away, that feeling is still there. That feeling still shows up sometimes every day. 
And when it shows up, it changes the way you see things. Well, we're adults. We're adults. Imagine how that impacts a child. Imagine how it impacts a child who's grown up in abuse and neglect. Johanna said he used to work at a daycare, and one of the first jobs he had was at a daycare, and they had a sign above the, the place where the babies got their diapers changed that said, change happens. Well, you know, when, when, when you've got the kind of brain that I do, you think about everything in the terms of stress and trauma. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. Because imagine how many little children that grew up in an environment of neglect who didn't get their diapers changed for hours and days who walked around naked. Imagine how much stress they have around change. At that age, you think they grow up and when the school bell rings and they get stressed out and knock the desk over or bite someone or push someone, you think anyone remembers that they lived in, in an environment of gross neglect for months, if not years, where change was not something that was good? We don't remember that, but those kind of experiences change our brain. All of these are common traumatic events. Birth trauma is the one I like to think about the most and, 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 and the most often because how many of us think about what our birth was like? I was adopted. So for seven months, and I've, I've met my biological mother, and we've talked about what my birth was like because I want to know. For seven months, she said it was good because she enjoyed being pregnant. But she said after seven months, she knew she wasn't going to be able to keep me. So she got depressed and she had to forget that I was there. Well, I'm eternally grateful for those seven months she's gave me because that really helped my brain have a foundation. Have a foundation that I could build up on. And then I carry, obviously, that sadness from her shutting down and going away from me. And, and, and that's a, for adopted children, that's an indelible lifelong imprint. It will affect you for the rest of your life. It still affects me to this day. But those seven months she gave me, gave me a foundation that I could build on. My sister, on the other hand, who was adopted, she was premature. She was born at three months old. She weighed three pounds. She was exposed to, to drugs and possibly alcohol as well. She was in an incubator for three months. Her brain was completely different, completely different. Her relationship with my parents was completely different. And we grew up in the same home. We grew up in the same home, but we both had a different experience. I think we're gonna have to get plugged in or we're gonna lose. You know, what's funny about this, um, everyone was getting a little stressed about the, uh, technology not working and uh, I was on Saturday I was given a I was given a talk I got fixed Trish I was given a talk on line uh, what was it, it wasn't line stealing defiance it was how to be a child whisperer how to deal with severe behaviors and I was at my mom's house, so I was in her living room. I got up early that morning, and I had this, you should have seen this set up. I had two ladders. I had my laptop on one ladder, I had my cell phone on another ladder, and I had it all set up just right. And You know, I was streaming, and I'm doing my little whiteboard stuff, and, and I do this on, 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 for Post Institute on Facebook. I just do these talks because it's important to me. I do, a face, I do a daily Facebook Live. So every day I'm on talking about something as it relates to children and families and healing. And I'm in the midst of, of doing my thing. And someone mentioned that the screen, they couldn't see the screen. It was backwards or something. So I started messing with the phone. And then the, the something, yeah, it got all twisted up. I couldn't figure it out. And this is streaming live, right? This is like not planned. And so finally, after fooling with it for a couple minutes, I'm like, ah, sorry, you're just going to have to deal with it. So I'm trying to get my phone set back up there. It won't set up there the way it needed to set up there. And then I finally got it set back up there, and the dang thing just fell over. It just all fell over. And I'm yelling for my mom, Mom, come help me. 
Come help me, Mom. And Mom's sleep, and she ain't trying to come out there because she knows I put all the personal family business in the streets. And she's probably afraid I'm going to put her on camera or something. And so we persevered. So the little technology challenges today, uh, I'm experienced now. <laughs> generational trauma. We don't think about generational trauma, but we should. We should. Your grandmother and your grandfather and what they went through and your great-grandmother and your great-grandfather, what they went through. Trauma gets passed down through the generations because it changes the DNA. It changes the DNA. So something that happened to great grandma could have got passed down to grandma, could have got passed down to your mother, could have got passed down to you, and you don't even realize it. So understanding what the generations have gone through is important because it gives you self-knowledge. Self-knowledge and self-awareness is so important. And then there's other lists. But all of these are just like common things that we don't think about. Ruby says the wound is the place where the light enters you. See, I like this. The reason I like this is because it's telling us not to be afraid of our pain, but to embrace our pain. See, and that's different from how we have been raised culturally. We've been raised not to talk about things. You don't share things. You don't let people know the family. That's a family matter. Well, guess what? The family doesn't want to deal with it because it hurts too much. So you just sweep it under the carpet. But the pain, through the pain, is where we find healing. Sheldon Kopp is, a, is an old psychotherapist. He's passed away now, but he's back in the 70s. And he said the only way out of something is to get into it. You have to be willing to get into it in order to get out of it. You have to be willing to get into the pain in order to get out of the pain. And we don't always like that. So my story, as I encourage you all to think about your story, is three separate stories. And I'm going to go over this quickly. That's me when I was a baby. That's my sister. And that's my adopted son, Kevin. He's 23 years old. We adopted him when he was 15 from Honduras. He came to our group home, actually, when he was 15. And then we ran the group home in Virginia till he was 18. And then we got ready to move back to Oklahoma. He didn't have anywhere to go, so we brought him with us. Three different adoption stories, three different trauma stories. And then it doesn't continue. There's my mom who raised me, my dad who raised me, and then there's my two daughters. Right? Those are all three different, those are four different trauma stories. And that doesn't even include the trauma of my biological mother and my biological father. My generational trauma goes way back, way back. And so you have to ask yourself, what's your story? Because your story helps you understand the story of others. Your pain helps you to understand the pain of others. When you are able to be open to your own story and be open to your own pain and come to a deeper understanding of that struggle and that challenge, you can more readily be open and present to others. It doesn't have to be scary anymore. Because Byron Katie says pain is pain. It's just pain. We don't like to cry because it hurts. We don't like other people to cry because it makes us hurt. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed how quickly when someone starts to cry, what the first thing we do is we either pat them on the shoulder, or we hand them a Kleenex. You know why we do that? Because we want them to freaking stop. <laughs> stop. It's okay. It's okay. You're going to make me cry. Come here. Let me give you a hug. Suck it down. We don't like it. It doesn't feel good to us, but it's not going to hurt us. It actually helps us feel better. Tears have the same Physiologic compound is stress. So when you are crying, you are literally releasing stress. The exact same as stress. So what's your story? Don't be afraid of your story. You don't have to, you know, get into you know, therapy and, and go to some big seminars or, 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 or do any big journaling or anything like that. It's just spend some time. Drive home and remember, it's just remembering. And as you remember, then allow that to guide you into some level of empathy for the kids you raise or the kids you work with or the adults you work with. 
Just think about yourself and think about that little person that you were that went through that pain and, and went through those challenges. And, and grieve for her or grieve for him, if you will. And help you just allow yourself to touch that, touch that sadness. And once you do that, and once you once you start to gain control over that, you realize that you're not going to die. Because that is the fear. The fear is that if we go there, we're going to die because we feel helpless. Because you felt helpless during the experience. So when the feeling connected to the experience shows up, you go right back to being in that same place. But you're not going to die. You're not going to die. You can have those feelings. And that's called being in control of your feelings. Being in control of your feelings is not stuffing it down and holding it in because you don't you really don't have any control over that. That's an illusion. You think you have control over your feelings, but you don't. Your feelings decide when they are ready to come out. Have you ever just busted out crying or has something ever just popped out of your mouth and you try to catch it and get it back in, but you can it's too late? That's because your feelings decide when they are going to come up. They decide when they are going to be expressed. Well, the way you turn that around is you choose to go in and have those feelings. When you start choosing to go in and have those feelings, then you're gaining control over them. Because this is a quintessential challenge with children. When we start talking about difficult behaviors, I'm just going to break this down and make this real simple for you. When a child starts to misbehave, it stresses you out. When it stresses you out, it stirs up a part of your brain connected to all your bad feelings. When all your bad feelings get stirred up, all you want to do is make those feelings go away. So the first thing you do is try to get that child to stop that behavior. You try to get that child to stop that behavior because you don't like feeling that way. But when you start going in and making a conscious choice to gain control over your feelings, then you can be a little more flexible with that child's behaviors. You can be a little more flexible with that child's emotions. Here's some steps towards mindfulness. And this is very important because this is something that when we start talking about trauma informed, this is where it's all got to start. Trauma informed has to start with you. Trauma-informed does not start with your understanding of the children you work with or the adults you work with. It starts with your understanding of yourself. And one of the biggest keys to that is the practice of mindfulness. The ability to slow down and pay attention to what you are thinking and what you are feeling in any given moment. This is the first key. And if we start talking about trauma-informed in any other place, we're going to miss the boat. We will totally miss the boat because we are not present ourselves. Mindfulness is so important. Breathing is so important. If there was one thing and one thing only out of out of the last 20 years that I could share. That would equip you more than anything else. It would be teaching you the ability to breathe, to slow down and breathe. Breathing is the one proven mechanism for interrupting your stress physiology. When you are stressed out, breathing is the one proven way to interrupt. It. And when you start breathing, it turns on your anti-stress hormone. However, the first thing we do when we become stressed is we stop breathing. We stop breathing, we start taking really short, ineffective breaths. And when we're doing that, it's increasing the cortisol in our brain from our amygdala. And when our cortisol is getting increased, our fight, fight, and freeze is getting increased. So slowing down and breathing is so important. It's so important that we're going to breathe right now. This is my mindfulness bowl. I've been carrying this bowl around for 15 years. And it has only two purposes. It's lived a simple life. We're probably not going to take a break unless I see half the room dozing off and someone starts snoring. Then we'll take a break. But usually it's to let you know after a break when we're going to start back because I don't say, okay, guys, let's go, let's go, let's go. I just ring the bowl. The second is a cue to breathe. 
You take three deep breaths, inhaling in your nose, exhaling out of your mouth. You do that three times. And so because it's so important, I like to practice it with you. And I love to breathe because it keeps me alive. Let's breathe. <laughs> Perfect. Practice your breathing when you are calm, because when you are stressed, it's automatic. You stop. But if you'll practice your breathing while you're calm, while you're driving, while you're curling your hair, while you're shopping for shoes, while you're while, while you're cooking, while you're doing laundry, while you're working, practice it, practice it, practice it. Then it becomes second nature. Then you may stop breathing for just a moment, but then you'll kick in to start breathing again. So here's some very quick steps for mindfulness. Number one is slow down. Slowing down doesn't mean you get less done. Slowing down means you slow down your thinking. So you slow down your thinking. You pay attention to those thoughts. That's all you're doing. You're not judging them. You're not trying to change them. You're just paying attention to them. It's like you come out here outside of yourself. Number two is you acknowledge the moment. Here's where I am right now. This is what's going on right now. And this can happen like this. It doesn't have to take a long period of time. Number two is you recognize your current thoughts and then you breathe. Child is misbehaving. Child is acting out. The first thing you do is you slow down. You get present. You start breathing. You pay attention to your thoughts. You don't have to say a word. You don't have to say a word. Listen without judgment. That's the hardest thing. We are so judgmental of ourselves, and then we become so judgmental of others. And then you start the process over again. Slow down, breathing, paying attention, acknowledging, listening without judgment, and starting over again. And you practice it and practice it and practice it. And it gives you an automatic, an automatic control over your child. This is automatic control. Let me tell you why. Because when you are able to get mindful, you are able to get present, you are able to turn off the vibration in your brain that is otherwise emitting stress and fear. And when you turn off the vibration in your brain that's emitting stress and fear, then you stop jacking your child's brain up. Because your child's brain's already jacked up. That's why they're acting out the way they do. See, an acting out child is a stressed out child. I couldn't make that any more simple for you. An acting out child is a stressed out child. And when we stress, we regress. Remember those two things. You should write them down. An acting out child is a stressed out child. And when we stress, we regress to an earlier emotional age. The children you're dealing with when you're dealing with them, they're not the age, they're not the age you think they are. They're not their chronological age. A child's misbehaving is not his chronological age. Your husband misbehaving, he's not his chronological age. When you are buying that, that 30th pair of shoes, you are not your chronological age. You're your emotional age. You're trying to feel good. Here's a couple, two key terms. Regulation. I love this term. I like to use regulation in the, in the place of stress. Or not regulation in place of stress, dysregulation in place of stress. Regulation is the ability to maintain stress within a window of tolerance. It's your ability to maintain stress within our window of tolerance. We all have a window of tolerance for how much stress we can handle. When we've handled as much stress as we can, then we exceed our window of tolerance and we move into dysregulation. Dysregulation is akin to being stressed out. And the reason I like to use dysregulation is because it has a different power than stress. I don't even like the word stress. I don't even like the word trauma. Because we have associations that diminish what they truly mean. When you go back to work tomorrow and your colleague says, hey, how you doing? I don't want you to say I'm stressed. I want you to say I'm dysregulated. <laughs> They're going to go, oh, are you contagious? 
it carries a different meaning. You've gone outside of your window of tolerance, and this is a very important scientific finding, and it's one which has defined my work. It is believed that affect dysregulation is a fundamental mechanism involved in all psychiatric disorders. It is believed that affect dysregulation is a fundamental mechanism involved in all psychiatric disorders. In the other words, in other words, it is believed that being stressed out, being stressed out is the reason for all psychological and emotional challenges. It is believed that being stressed out is the fundamental reason for all psychological and emotional challenges. If that is true, which I believe it is, because I've believed this and followed it wholeheartedly for 15 years. If, if being stressed out is the cause of all psychological and emotional challenges, and I see someone having psychological and emotional challenges, then what does this very simply tell me I need to do for this person? Go ahead, take a risk. Regulate. Regulate. Reduce their stress. Reduce their stress. I just gave you a revolutionary process. Right there. The next time you see someone in psychological and emotional stress, all you have to do is reduce their stress. Calm their stress. And the next time you see someone in psychological and emotional and emotional distress, the first thing you got to do is regulate yourself. Regulate yourself because they will stress you out. And when they start stressing you out, you will stress them out even more. And what happens when you put two crazy people together? You get more crazy, right? Someone's got to be able to calm themselves down. Someone has got to be able to regulate. I want you to think about that from a brain-based perspective. You got your seven-year-old who's acting crazy, and then you got you who's 40 acting crazy. What are you going to get more of? You're going to get more crazy. Who's responsible for calming the environment? The adult is. We've got to be able to calm ourselves down and keep from getting so overwhelmed. Let's talk a little bit about the brain. Bruce Perry says if you work with children, you must have a generous understanding of the brain. Just a generous understanding. That's all I've got. That's all I'm going to share with you. First is the amygdala. Your fight, fight, or freeze reaction in your brain. Our initial reaction to stress. And, and one of the things that's important is a lot of times you'll hear professionals talking about the amygdala responding. The amygdala does not respond. Our response requires conscious processing. The amygdala is all unconscious. It is all emotional. It does not think. It is all reactive. It is immediate, instantaneous. Anytime it senses a threat because the amygdala is activated through the sensory pathways. Anytime it senses a threat, it gets activated and releases cortisol. Cortisol being your primary stress hormone in your brain. Your amygdala is, is, begins its formation right after the brain stem, which begins its formation right after conception. By the 18th month, your amygdala is online. You ever dealt with the oppositional defiant child? Sure you have. If you've dealt with a child at all, you've dealt with some defiance. I've got something really simple for you. A defiant child is a scared child. A defiant child is a scared child. Because in the moment when you make the request, their brain goes into freeze. That's why they ignore you. That's why they act like you didn't say anything. That's why they can't pay any attention to you. Because in the moment, their brain has gone into freeze. But see, we have assigned so much negative power. So much negative power to the behavior of defiance that as soon as a child ignores us, the first thing we want to do is smack them in the back of the head and say, did you hear me? Because we've given that act so much power. What happens when you take all the power away from that act? You take all that negative power away from that act. Because essentially what you're doing, as long as you give that defiance, that defiant state, as long as you give it all that power, you're, you're powerless. You're giving it all to that state. And what it does, it makes you act crazy. Makes you yell, makes you walk up to the child, say, did you hear me? 
Did you hear me? I know you heard me. And then you just start turning off stuff and taking away stuff. You just go on a mad frenzy. And then when it's all taken away and it's all torn up, you stand there and you go, God, Lee, why did I do that? Because stress causes confused and distorted thinking. This is very important. Stress causes confused and distorted thinking and suppresses the short-term memory. When we are stressed out, we are not thinking clearly and we cannot remember. And let me tell you, this could this goes so deep. It go, it's so simple and it goes so deep. I, I, I could spend all day just talking to you about this one thing. And it's so important in classrooms. It's so important in schools. It's so important in parenting. When we are stressed, when we are stressed, our thinking becomes confused and distorted because your amygdala starts banging against the pituitary gland. It comes over to the hippocampus and it starts, the cortisol starts washing all over the hippocampus. And when the cortisol starts doing that, it confuses the thinking processes. It's like the signal, it gets staticky. Your short-term memory shuts down. You can't remember. You can't remember. And this is exactly why we do the same thing over and over and over and over again and expect a different outcome. Because in that moment of stress, we cannot remember that we just tried that an hour ago. We just tried that yesterday. We've been trying this for the last 10 weeks. We've been doing this for six months. And it's still not working. The child is just getting older, not getting better. Because that's what happens. Children grow older, they don't grow better. Because we keep doing the same thing, and that's creating stress. When we're creating stress, our thinking gets confused and distorted, and our short-term memory is suppressed. When you're in a school and a child is acting out, that child cannot learn while they're acting out. When you're in a school and the child feels threatened, the child cannot learn when they feel threatened. You cannot learn when you feel threatened. You can't think clearly when you don't feel safe. So the first thing we have to do is we have to create safety. We have to get the person to be able to calm down. If you can't calm that child down, you can't go anywhere else. You can, but the effort in trying is coming from your own confusion and distortion and the suppression of your short-term memory. It's so simple and it goes so deep. It's so simple that it overwhelms our brains. But this, this dynamic, we do, we play this out over and over and over again. So the amygdala, of course, has the cortisol, which goes to the hippocampus. But what you also have to understand about the amygdala is when you get stressed out, your brainstem gets activated. When your brainstem gets activated, what's, guess what's stored in your brainstem? Trauma. Trauma is stored in the brainstem. And guess what the brainstem doesn't do? It doesn't differentiate between stress and trauma. So when you get stressed out and your brainstem gets activated, where also your personality traits are stored, your brain doesn't know the difference. You don't know the difference. So as soon as you get stressed out, when you hit a certain level of stress, all your trauma gets stirred up. And that's how you start to see. That's the, that's the lens you start looking through. So it passes over, it, so cortisol passes the pituitary gland, past the hypothalamus to the hippocampus. The hippocampus and the orbital frontal cortex are supposed to work together. The orbital frontal cortex being your social emotional control center. It doesn't complete its development until you're 25 years old. So your executive control center for social and emotional relationships doesn't complete its development until you're 25 years old. But we sure do expect kids to, to behave and, and act and get along with one another, don't we? But the part of their brain that's responsible for that isn't even fully developed until they're 25. So really, scientifically, a child is not an adult until they're 25. Now, I know you don't want to hear that because you want them the hell out of the house at 18. But really, if you want to think about it, they're not ready for a real world until they're 25. And that's if they haven't experienced early trauma because early trauma slows all that stuff down. Now, here's the thing that's important. Your hypothalamus releases a hormone, and this is, this is the hormone. It's called oxytocin. Oxytocin is your brain's anti-stress hormone. Oxytocin is a hormone that makes love possible. Without oxytocin, you can't even feel and experience love. 
Now, here's what's important about oxytocin, about the hypothalamus, is that it is a learned response in your brain. Meaning if you grow up in an environment of neglect, an environment of trauma, if you have if you have serious trauma, then your oxytocin gets suppressed. So it's not able to calm your cortisol down because that's what it's supposed to do. When your amygdala is pumping out cortisol, your hypothalamus is supposed to release oxytocin in order to slow down the cortisol output. But because it's a learned response, if you grew up in an environment of neglect or stress or emotional absence, your, your oxytocin response doesn't operate the way it needs to. Because who's responsible for teaching us oxytocin? Our parents, the adults around us. And I love the concept of five, five adults around one child. That's a, that's a fantastic concept. That's a beautiful thing. Of course, that's going to make a huge difference. Because you got five people instead of one stressed out person giving the child affection and attention and time and nurturing and love, it's going to change the brain. It couldn't help but change the brain. But this is a very important thing, this oxytocin response, because we all rely on it. See, eye contact elicits oxytocin. A smile, being rocked and cuddled and touched and nurtured, all that re releases oxytocin. But if you didn't get it early in life, you ain't got it now. I say ain't because I'm from, I'm from Oklahoma. I, I can do that. If you didn't get it, you ain't got it. If you didn't get it, you ain't got the ability to calm your stress. This is important because an acting out child is a what? A stressed out child. But if that child comes from an, uh, an environment of stress, high stress and neglect, and now they're stressed out, what do they not have? The ability to calm themselves down. Then who's responsible? We are. The adults are responsible. Whether you're at home, whether you're at church, whether you're in school, whether you're in the Boy Scouts, the adult is responsible for creating an oxytocin response in that child's brain to help calm down that cortisol. Otherwise, they don't get it. Sending the child to time out doesn't turn on their oxytocin. Spanking the child's butt doesn't turn on his oxytocin. Giving a child a consequence doesn't turn on his oxytocin. Giving him a drug doesn't turn on his oxytocin. Taking his points away, taking his toys away doesn't, doesn't turn on his oxytocin. You know what all those things do? Stresses him out. Just reinforces what he's already experiencing. And that's why children don't grow better. They only grow older. Because those are the most common things we do with children, aren't they? We're going to talk about that. We're not, you're not there yet. Did you guys get handouts? You get it? Okay, so there's a list of key terms you can you can look at. And what's the most important thing? See, this is not something we don't talk about, a lot about. We are biologically engineered. Biological. Every cell, every syn synapse, every dendrite in our brain, in our body, is biologically engineered to be in relationship. In relationship. Relationship is what ensures survival. Relationship. Without relationship, we don't exist. If this is true, if this is true, what becomes the most important thing? The relationship. It's so simple. Everything I share with you is really simple. And a lot of times I just say the same thing over and over and over. And the answer is usually stress or relationship or love. That's usually the answer. Someone in here gets a chance to just be a know-it-all. Just think, stress, relationship, or love, you probably got it. Because it's so simple, but it's not easy. Everything I teach is super simple, but it's not easy. It's not easy because that's not our conditioning. That's not our wiring. That's not our society that we live in. So it's a different paradigm. It's a different lens. That's where it becomes challenging. The relationship is the most important thing. When you lose the relationship, you lose everything. Without the relationship, all you have the ability to do is be overpowering and controlling. And guess how long you can overpower and control a scared child? 
until they hit adolescence. And then you can't do nothing with them. By then, you've lost all the opportunity. Because in our society, we spend so much time trying to control behaviors, trying to suppress them, trying to overpower them. And we spend so little time working on relationship and allowing relationship to influence those behaviors. See, relationship can heal trauma. Relationship. Love is the only thing. L-O-B-E. Love is the only thing that heals trauma. Not therapy, not medication. Love. Love in relationship. That's the only thing that heals trauma, heals the brain. Not stress, not fear, not spanking, not punishment. Love. And our ability to be able to provide it to another person, another individual. You don't have to be a therapist for that. You just have to be a human being who's willing to take a risk who's willing to say, I'm going to do something a little bit different than what was done to me. I remember my, my daughter was two years old. I was in graduate school, and her mother and I, my wife at the time, we were, we were in the kitchen. It was early in the morning, and she was ironing, and I was standing here at the cabinet. We lived in this little apartment. I still remember it. And we were bickering about something. We weren't yelling or screaming because we didn't do that. We were just bickering. And it was stressful. It was tense. And my little daughter, she's now 22, she was two years old, about 18 months old, and she was walking around naked, because I've always been a little bit of a hippie. But she's walking around naked, and she's right in the middle of us, and she starts to pee. She starts to pee, and I pick her up, and I swat her on the butt, and I carry her, you don't pee on the floor, you pee on the potty. And I take her into the bathroom, and I set her down on the, on the toilet, and I'm standing over like this, and she's, you know, standing, sitting there on the, on the toilet, and then... The biggest tear welled up in her eye and fell over her little chubby cheek and started to stream down her face. And I just melted. And I said, oh my gosh, honey. I got down on my knees and I said, daddy will never hit you again. I am so sorry. And I never hit my child again, even though that's the way I was raised. Even though that would have been the most natural, that's how everyone in my family, all my friends, that's how we were all raised. That'd been the most natural thing in the world to spank a child. But I made a commitment to my child in that moment, and I don't know any of it, I didn't know any of the stuff I know now, that I was going to do something different. I didn't have to be a therapist to know that I wanted to do something different, that I wanted a relationship with my child. I didn't want fear. And we all have the ability to be able to choose that. So let's talk about the three pathways of emotional expression. What time wait, What time is it? Four o'clock? Okay, so here's the thing. We all have three ways in which we express emotion. And emotion is energy in motion. It's a body state. Your body only knows two states. It knows thriving and it knows surviving. Thriving, surviving. Ultimately, your body only knows two emotions, love and fear. When your body is in a state of love, your cellular system is open. When your body is in a state of stress and fear, it is constricted. It is in survival. We only have three pathways through which we express emotion. And they are attitudes, feelings, and behaviors. Those are our three pathways. Now let me ask you a very serious question. As a child, how many of you could roll your eyes and talk back to your parents? Anybody? Without, without fearing for your life? Not usually. Not usually. Attitudes were not okay. What did you always hear? Don't give me that attitude. Don't roll your eyes at me. I'll knock your eyes into the back of your head. It's like the, the most normal thing for a parent to say back in the day. If you can't express through your attitudes, what do you do with that energy? It goes to feelings. How many of you could yell at your parents or cuss them out? No, you really didn't go there, right? No. So we couldn't yell because children were meant to be seen and not heard. 
If you can't express through your attitudes, if you can't express through your feelings, what do you have left? Behaviors. Behaviors. How many of us could freely act out? No. We did, but it was never okay. You can't express through your attitudes, you can't express through your feelings, and you have behaviors. You can't express through your behaviors. What are you left with? You're left with anger and depression. And anger and depression have to come out through behaviors. Anger and depression don't have any other option except to come out through behaviors. Now, as we get older, those behaviors a lot of times manifest as health issues. Ulcers, fibromyalgia, high blood pressure, migraines. All that is is anger and depression that's turned inward. Anger and depression must come through behaviors. So if you're a child who's learned that attitudes aren't okay, and feelings aren't okay, and behaviors aren't okay, what can you do with that? Well, you get attitude, you get anger and depression, and I call that the trauma triangle. When you lived in anger, depression, and behaviors for six months or longer, you're living in a state of trauma. The level of stress is high enough to be a pervasive traumatic environment. When you're at anger, depression, and behavior for six months or longer, this is where you get diagnosis. This is where you get residential treatment. This is where you get medication. This is where you get restraint at that level. Children must be able to express their emotions. And this is another situation, another situation where we have assigned negative power to meaningless things. We have, signed, we have assigned a great deal of negative power to a child rolling their eyes. When was the last time you ever saw a child roll their eyes and the adult's arm fell off? Or the child, the child talked back and the adult got diabetes? Or, 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 or the child huffed and puffed and the adult fell over dead? It doesn't happen. But we sure act like it's going to, don't we? Child rolls their eyes like, oh, no, don't, no, you did roll your eyes at me. Don't you talk to me that way. Why do we do that? When we don't want our children to misbehave. We don't want them to misbehave, but we don't want them to express their attitudes. We don't want them to misbehave, but we don't want them to express their feelings. What exactly do we want them to do? You see the conundrum we get ourselves in? The very things we want our children to do, we push against them to not do. And for children who come from environments of trauma, depending on the age in which you get them, they have been so suppressed. They're, they've been so suppressed that they're now medicated. Because that's what we do. We suppress them, and then because the behaviors have to come out, we then medicate it, or then we punish it in some kind of way. It's all an attempt to keep the behaviors down, but we don't want the attitudes and the feelings. You know what has to happen? What has to happen for a child to not mis misbehave? If you really want a child to not misbehave, you've got to let the child express their attitudes and their feelings. Because as soon as you allow the child to express their attitudes and their feelings, guess what? They don't have to drop down to behavior. They don't have to drop into behavior. But we get so threatened. We get so threatened by behavior. Let me back up for just a minute. We get so threatened by behavior because here's what happens. Our amygdala, when our children are misbehaving, our fear receptor in our brain sees a threat. And when the fear receptor in our brain sees a threat, it starts pumping out cortisol. And so cortisol puts us in that fight, flight, or freeze state. So we, we're not sure what to do. We just know that there's a risk, that there's a threat to our lives. And so in that state, we see that negative behavior, we see that threat, and we are unconsciously, reactively motivated to make it go away. That's all we want to do. Have you, have you noticed how intense you get about suppressing a child's negative behavior? It's like that is the, we become obsessed with getting them to stop doing that thing. And we call that trying to get them to be responsible. 
trying to trying to teach them how to be responsible citizens, raising good children. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with the fact that we feel threatened. We as adults feel threatened and we want them to stop because we don't like feeling stressed out. That's why you have to learn in the midst of stress to calm yourself down first. Because then what you realize is the child is trying to transition through emotion. See, when a child rolls their eyes and you tell them to take out the trash, or you tell them to get up and turn on, off the television, and they roll their eyes, you should be happy. You should be happy. Because they are actually making a movement. That is a movement to turn that television off, to go take that trash out. Now remember, they have to transition. But we're the ones who interrupt it. The child rolls their eyes and huff and puff, and as soon as they do that, we're right on top of them saying, don't roll your eyes and don't huff and puff, which then increases more stress, and then they freeze even more. See, we create the dynamic. What we actually want is we want the child to be able to take the trash out. We shouldn't care how they get to it how they get to doing it. We really should not care whether they have attitudes about it or feelings about it, because they should, because we would too if we were having, if we had to go take it out. And that's usually why we get so mad at them, because we have so many feelings about not wanting to take the stinky trash out. Because we had to take the stinky trash out as kids, now you're going to take the stinky trash out. Right or wrong? It's very simple. It's very simple, but it gets so complex. When that child rolls their eyes or huffs and puffs or even yells or screams or, Lord, help us, says a curse word. Oh. Celebrate. Be happy about it. Because they are expressing their emotion. And we don't have to like it. See, I'm not telling you it's okay. I'm not telling you you have to like it. Because we don't like to hear it. We don't want to see it. But you have to celebrate it because the child is not going to drop into behaviors. A child who learns how to express their attitudes and their feelings doesn't have to drop into behaviors. Do you understand that? When you can express your attitudes and your feelings, you don't have to go to behaviors. You may not go and take that trash out right away, but you're eventually going to go take that trash out. But what's happening is you as the adult are not becoming a threat. Because as soon as you're on top of that child about not doing what you say to do, when you say to do it, then you're becoming the threat. And when you become the threat, it's no longer about the trash. Now you're just creating more negative association with taking the trash out. It's just condition. It's literally classical conditioning. We do it over and over and over again. Let the child roll their eyes. Let them, let them have their fusses and their feelings. And say, thank you, son. I love you, too. And the kitchen's going to smell so much better when that trash is taken out. And then go in the other room and take a value. <laughs> Relax. Uh, we mentioned that there are some books out there. I'll tell you about this real quick. Postinstitute.com, post books. Is, you can actually go online and order the books. We only have fear of love here today. But you actually get both books, two for 15 bucks, and the Great Behavior Breakdown, where I talk about 27 of the most severe behaviors. You can go, it will be shipped to you. So you just fill out one of those, go online and do it. You pick up the Fear to Love today, show the people at the table that you that you paid for it, and they'll give you that one, and then the Great Behavior Breakdown will be shipped to you. If all we do is focus and become consumed with diminishing, reducing, changing, control, and suppressing the behavior, what we're going to be doing is ignoring everything underneath it. And that's very important because that's what our brain wires us to do. Our brain wires us to become consumed with folk in con consumed with controlling the behavior or suppressing the behavior. And we stop listening to the stress and the fear. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about next. Let's take about a five-minute break. Stand up. Move around. Let's get the lights on. Get our circadian rhythms moving around, and then we'll talk about that. Five minutes. This is for the ball.
Just taking a little break here, YouTube. We'll be back with you shortly. <clears throat> Just taking a little break here, Facebook Live. Hi, Mom. This is actually going to serve as our, our, our post daily dose for the day. Um, see your, your, your comment there, David. If you haven't failed your child, it's never too late to, to do something different. It's never too late to build relationships. And lifelong, our social emotional control center, our orbital frontal cortex is open for development. So relationship is never never too far away. So so never give up. Never give up. Okay, let's keep going. We're going to talk about the stress model. This is really the model that I've been using for the better part of 15 years to help me in my work with challenging children as well as in my own life because I feel like the stress model applies to human human behavior. It's not just a, a child behavior model, though, though it is, um, in my opinion, um, the most effective model for viewing challenging behaviors. And again, the stress model is very simple. It says all behavior, all behavior, doesn't matter what the behavior is, you can list them. It's, it's, like I said, the Great Behavior Breakdown book that I wrote, it's 27 of the most difficult behaviors that children demonstrate, and all of those behaviors are connected here. All behaviors arise from a state of stress. What you have to understand about stress is that stress can be triggered through any of your sensory pathways. 
So your sight, your sound, your smell, your touch, your taste, your temperature, your movement, your digestion can all trigger stress. Stress leads to emotion. As I said, emotion is energy in motion. There are only two primary emotions, love and fear. Those are our only two primary emotions. It is through the expression, the processing, and the understanding of the fear that we can calm the stress and diminish the behavior. It's through the expression, the processing, and the understanding of the fear that we can calm the stress and diminish the behavior. So it goes back to the definition of dysregulation, the scientific finding about dysregulation. That being stressed out is the fundamental cause of all psychological and emotional challenges. Well, the stress model just ties right into that. Because the stress model says all behavior arises from a state of stress. In between the behavior and the stress is the presence of a primary emotion, love or fear. Because we're talking about challenging behaviors, difficult behaviors, we're talking about stress. Stress and fear are interchangeable. Remember, there's only thriving and surviving. So the moment you become stressed, your cellular system constricts into survival. You have trillions of cells in your body, and the moment you become stressed, your entire system constricts into survival. Let me have you do something for me real quick. Hold your hand up. This is a cell in your body. This is a cell, free floating. When I say stress, ball up to a fish. Stress. Stress, ball a little tighter. You are stressed out, got it good and tight. In that state of stress, shake hands with the person next to you. Go ahead and try. Try to shake hands with the person next to you. You can't do it. You can't do it. We cannot be in relationship when we are stressed out. Imagine the stress and pain that occurs in a family when everyone is stressed out because everyone is trying to connect. Everyone wants to connect. Everyone wants to experience love, but instead everyone feels stress and fear. The only way to get through stress and fear is to slow down and breathe and turn on our oxytocin and try to find something, some place, some source where we can begin to feel good and get some oxytocin going so that we can move into a space of love. Because that's it. It's just love and fear. There's nothing else beyond those two. Now your brain can, can cognitively interpret an emotional state and label it all kinds of feelings. That's all a feeling is. A feeling is a cognitive interpretation of an emotional state. But that's cognitive. That's your left hemisphere. Your left hemisphere is dictated to by your right hemisphere. Your emotional brain, your right hemisphere is connected to your body. Your left hemisphere sets over here and, and your right hemisphere dictates it. So all these feelings that we create, all these feelings that we see, they're just cognitive interpretations of emotion. There are only two primary emotions and that's love and fear. Anything else, anything else, arises from those two states. Ultimately, all behavior, good or bad, arises from love or fear. All behavior, good or bad, arises from love or fear. If it is not loving, it is from fear. And if it is from fear, it is from stress. And all you've got to do is calm the stress, starting with your own stress. That sounds so simple. It is. It's not easy, though. And I'm telling you this after spending 20 years, 20 years working with some of the most difficult children and families from around the world, living with them sometimes in their homes. I've owned group homes with adolescent children who had not been treated successfully in the state at all, had been all sent out. We brought them all back. Brand schools and treatment homes. And I am telling you that severe behavior arises from stress and fear. And all you have to do is calm the stress. 
and help the child learn to start talking about their fear. And if they're angry, if they appear angry, let them start in anger. Let them express their anger. But just know their anger comes from fear. Their fear comes from stress. And children who come from backgrounds of trauma have plenty to be upset about. They have plenty to be stressed out about. They have plenty to be frightened about. See, I call them traumatized children stress sensitive and fearful. They are stress sensitive and fearful. And you are literally just degrees away from having breakthroughs with your children. If you can just become a little fearless. Fearless. You don't have to have no fear because it's impossible because we all have fear. We all have stress, but just degrees. If you can just dial the fear down a little bit, you are close to a breakthrough with your child. Because your child is just waiting for you to lead the way. But the only way you lead the way is by calming your own brain, your own fear down, turning on oxytocin. We have to turn on oxytocin. If we're not turning on oxytocin, we're not helping children heal. I just want to be real honest and candid with you. If you get nothing from me, you will get that I will shoot you straight. If you are not turning on oxytocin in a child's brain, you are not going to help them heal because they are going to stay in a state of stress. In secure attachment, security, comfort, certainty, predictability comes when a child is able to not be stressed. The brain requires prolonged states of regulation in order to heal. Prolonged states, and they have to have repetition of positive environments and positive relationships, which lead to prolonged states of regulation in order for the brain to heal. It's not the stress that's the problem. It's not the stress that's the challenge. It's our inability to repair it that's the problem. Stress is a natural byproduct of living. If you're living, you're going to be stressed. It's our ability to repair the stress that makes all the difference. It's when we don't repair it. It's when we get upset and stressed out as parents and we say ugly things or maybe we do ugly things, but we don't take the time to repair it. That's where the problems come into place. It's when our children have experienced bad things in their lives and we don't make the time and put forth the effort and have the courage to sit with them and, 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 and witness to them and, and ask them to share their pain and be willing to hear it and want to hear it and need to hear it. I can't tell you how many children over the, the span of my career and adults that I've sat in front of and I have just cried. I have just cried and cried and cried because I know no one has ever cried for them or with them based on the things they've experienced. And sometimes I'm the first one because the pain is so big, it's just got to come out. And sometimes it's got to come out through me to open that up for them. But if we're not okay with our own feelings, we can't do that for someone else. That's why we have to get aware of our own stress and our own traumas and our own pain so we can realize it's not scary. It's just pain. And you've got these sad kids all around you. They're all sad. Teenagers, doesn't matter the age. They're all just sad. They've never just had someone love them. I'll tell you a real quick story. When we had our group home, in uh, Virginia, I used to go and, and work, be with the boys all the time. And, and one particular night, we were short on staff, and, and I, I needed to go to this meeting in this other city. And so I was myself and the program director were going to go to this meeting. We didn't really have the staff that we normally would have had. I don't know where they were at. So we had a school to one of our teachers from the school that the boys knew. And then we also had our housekeeper stay with the boys. And I said to the teacher, I said to the housekeeper, you don't have to do anything else. Just 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 be here. You don't have to try to discipline them. You don't have to try to tell them what to do. Just let them do whatever they're going to do. Just be here. How, how, how much easier and clearer can that be? Just be here. Because I knew my boys. I knew my boys. They were good boys. And these are boys that were considered the worst boys. But at this point in time, they all knew they were loved. They all, they all had security. We had already created that. I said, just be here with them. So me and the program director, we went, went to the meeting, and I'm in the middle of the meeting, my phone rings. That's one of my kids. His, name was, his nickname was Little Bear. 
As soon as the phone rang, I, I was like, oh, my gosh. Hello? Post. Where you at, Post? I said, I'm in this meeting, man. He said, when are you coming home? I'm gone. This meeting's going to be wrapping up here pretty quick. Just, you know, just, just chill. Oh, all right, all right. Hang up. Five minutes later, phone rings again. Post. Where are you at, Post? Mr. O is tripping, man. Dude, I'm about to finish this meeting. I'm about to be head right there. Just, you know, hang on. Hang up. Driving back. Post, where you at? I'm on my way. All right. Get there. All the boys are outside. It's like 9.30 at night. It's dark. All the boys are outside. Mr. Rose standing there. Two cop cars are there. Police are there. They're all in the front yard. The housekeeper had quit. She had quit and went home. So I told the program director, I said, go ahead and go home. And you don't, don't even talk to him. Just go get in your car, go home. I went over. How you doing, Mr. Rowe? I appreciate you. You can go ahead and go home. And he was ready to go home. And I said to police officers, guys, it, it's okay. Is anything bad happened? Nothing bad had happened. I said, okay, thank you. He said, you sure you don't need us to say? I said, no, I'm good. Okay, they left. And I said, give me the ball, because they were just out in the front. I said, come on, let's go. I'm bouncing the bar. Let's go. Up, up. Let's go to bed. It's time to go. Time to go. Let's go. Everyone in the house, 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 in the house. Let's go. In the house. In about five minutes, five minutes, I had all the boys in the house and in their bedrooms and in the bed. And so I'm sitting at the top of the stairs. And then a little bear. And Doug, they came out doo -doo -doo -doo, down the stairs, went to the kitchen. Well, you know, they came out of the room. I just scoot over and let them go out. I didn't say nothing. Right? That's so why I tell you when in times of stress and times of challenging behaviors, the first thing you got to do is you got to stop and breathe. Well, I didn't, I didn't go. I didn't get up. I didn't say nothing. I just sat there. The reason I sat there is because I needed to make sure the other boys didn't come out too. Right? I have to regulate the environment with what I can regulate, starting with me. So after I realized the other boys didn't come out, I went downstairs and they were in the kitchen sitting at the table eating syrup. So I sat down. And they were like, oh man, post, it was crazy around here tonight. Mr. O was tripping. And you know, blah, blah, blah. And then Doug said, yeah. And, and D, he peed in the floor. Yeah. <laughs> these, are, these are 16 year old boys. And I said, did what? Say he peed in the floor. I said, oh, really? Dang. Where are you peeing the floor at? Right over there where the chair is. They took the chair put the chair over the, 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 <laughs> the pee. <laughs> so I got up and went and I moved the chair. Looked at it. I went into the kitchen. Got on the sink. Got some cleaner. Got a towel. Went back over. Got down. And started cleaning it up. And D is sitting there going. <laughs> and so I'm cleaning it up. And he said, man, Post, I didn't expect you to do that. I mean, you, that wasn't meant for you to do that. Like, well, buddy, it's my fault. What do you mean? So I go put the stuff in the sink, put the stuff up, come, and I sat back down. I said, the only reason you peed in the floor is because you were so stressed out. You were feeling like a scared two-year-old. Because only a two-year-old would pee on the floor. And that tells me just how stressed out you are. And I apologize. I thought I was leaving you guys in safe hands. But obviously, I hadn't. So I'm sorry. And then Doug said, well, I should pee on the floor. <laughs> and I just looked at him and I said, you got to do what you got to do, buddy. Oh, I'm going to go pee on the floor. Okay, whatever. You know, you just said that. Y'all finish your cereal, go to bed. So they finished their cereal and they went to bed. We never discussed it again after that. Well, that's when, when Little Bear was 16. Well, a couple years ago, he's 22, 23 years old now. A couple years ago, he came out to visit. And 
in the course of driving around one day, he told my wife at the time, you know when the first time I ever felt like someone loved me was? And he told him the story, told her the story of peeing in the floor and me cleaning it up. He said, before that, I never felt like anyone had loved me. That's the power of love over fear. That's the power of seeing underneath the behavior, understanding stress, understanding fear, and understanding that the behavior is not what's important. The behavior is only a signal. It is only a red flag for what's underneath. And when we can calm our own stress and we can calm our own fear, then we can change behavior. No, the boys never peed in the floor again. Is that, isn't that the fear, right? If you let them get away with it, if you don't punish them, if you don't give them a consequence, if you at least don't lecture them for an hour, they're just going to do it again. No, they didn't do it again. The reason they didn't do it again is because I didn't let them get that stressed out again. It's my responsibility to create a regulated environment when a child is not able to regulate their own feelings and emotions. Because my creating that regulated environment and creating those regulated relationships is what helps them learn how to regulate. When they learn how to regulate, they won't ever get to that place again. Because they won't get that stress because they'll have an effective window of tolerance. And this is with all behaviors. With all behaviors. Here's the parenting continuum. This is just something to think about. I'm gonna go over this real quick. You see, you see the right side's reactivity and fear, negative one after negative 100. The left side's responsibility and love, negative one, positive one, positive 100. The far extreme of the reactivity and the fear side is the death penalty. The far extreme of responsibility and love is perfect love, the love of Jesus manifested. If you will think about this, the things I have listed here, time out, isolation, spanking, consequences, behavior modification, yelling, physical tactics like restraint, and medication rather than mod modification of environments and relationships, those are the most common things we do with children, especially traumatized children. They are the most common things we do. And the, the thing is, they're on the scale of negative 1 to negative 10. We don't even get all the way out to negative 100, but the reality is they sit on the same continuum. These things sit on the same continuum as the death penalty. And when has the death penalty ever been an effective deterrent to crime? It has not been. So what makes us think if the far extreme is an effective deterrent, anything less is going to be an effective deterrent? It's not going to be. But here's the thing. And here's why we use these things. And I grew up having received these things. Almost all of you did, and we still do to this day. The reason we do these things the time out, the spanking, the isolation, the yelling, the consequences is because they work on 70% of children. These things work. And so we use them on those 70% of children and we just assume they're going to work on the other 30%. But guess what? Here's the secret. Here's what we don't realize. On the 70% of children, anything you do will work because their brains can tolerate stress. They're not the traumatized children. With the, the Dr. Nadine, she quoted the statistic of 67% of, of people in that study had experienced at least one adverse childhood experience. 67%. Those people in the 67 percentile, they can deal with stress. But the other 33, they can't. They can't. Their brains don't deal with stress the same way, but because 70% of children, we can use these things on, it, on them and it works, we just assume with traumatized children, we can use it on them. And then when it's not working, guess what we do? And this is when you know you're stressed out. This is when you know your short-term memory is suppressed. Because if one level of it isn't working, guess what we do? We do more of it. If five minutes of timeout isn't enough, we give you 10 minutes. If one spanking isn't enough, I give you another one. If one consequence isn't enough, I give you a more extreme one. If one pill isn't enough, I'll give you two or three more. 
See, that's, that's coming from a confused and distorted place. That's coming from stress. That tells you that we are stressed. Because we can't be any more creative than this. And this is what we've been doing for generations. We can't be any more creative because fear and stress say fix it. And that's all these things are doing is trying to fix it. But these things don't grow children better. They only grow them older. You don't do time out because children don't act out for attention. Children act out because they need attention. You don't put a child in isolation because that's not turning on their oxytocin. That's not helping them develop internal regulation. That's only isolating them. That, how's that any different than a child who grows up in an environment of neglect and deprivation? It's no different. We just do it in a more general way. Spanking. Spanking is such an old, old generational condition behavior. And we always go back to the Bible. Spare the rod, spoil the child. You got to whip that butt. The rod and the staff were used in the raising of sheep. The rod was used to guide and the staff was used to pull them back in the line when they, when they strayed. The rod wasn't used to beat the sheep with. If the shepherd beat the sheep, the sheep would flee. Spare the rod, spoil the child means spare the child guidance and they will be spoiled to the ways of the world. They'll run away and get eaten by the wolves. It doesn't mean beat a child over the head with it. You hit your children, they're just, become, they're just going to become stressed out and scared. And you are the one they're going to become afraid of. And you're going to wonder why when they hit adolescence, they don't listen to you anymore. And they, they have a gang of friends that they go hang out with that are all delinquents too. Because they've all gone through the same thing. Hitting children doesn't work. It only stresses them out. If what you're doing with your child causes them more stress, it is not going to lead to healing. It is only going to jeopardize your relationship. And you will not experience it until your child hits pre-adolescence. Because up until then, you can overpower them. You can whip their butts. You can drag them by the arm and by the hair and by the back of the shirt and do whatever you want to do to them. But when they get pre, when they hit pre-adolescence, they start to get a little stronger. They start to get a little smarter. And then they start to rebel. Teenagers rebel because we haven't invested in the relationship. You invest in the relationship and you influence the child. You don't have to control. You can say to your child when you've invested in the relationship, I really don't want you to go out tonight. But I know you're 16. You're probably going to do whatever you think you need to. I'm going to go on in here and sit down and I hope you make the right decision. And they go to the door and they're mad. And they pick up their cell phone and call their friends and say, I'm not going to go out tonight. Or they go outside anyway. They go to the street and they tell their friends, I'm staying home. That's what relationship does. Control doesn't do that. Control causes the child to rebel and go out and get drunk and everything else and come in late. Consequences don't teach children responsibility. I hate to tell you this. No, I love to tell you this, actually. Consequent, a consequence, when you give a child a consequence, it is a reaction to an action. It is not a response to an action. A response requires thought. A consequence is a reaction to an action. The child has to do something before they get the consequence. So what you're actually teaching a child when you give them a consequence is not responsibility. You're teaching them how to be more reactive because children learn through modeling of the adults. Modeling. So they're modeling what you do. They're learning how to be more reactive. They're not learning how to be more responsible. Responsibility requires teachers willing to be responsible. When I say a teacher, I mean a disciple. Because the definition of discipline is to teach, not to punish. If we want to be truly effective disciples and we truly want to have effective discipline, then we must learn to teach, not to punish. And if you want to teach a child, you want to make sure they are in a regulated functioning brain. You want to make sure that their short term memory is engaged and is open. I can go on and on about that. Time in. Children don't act out because they need attention. Children don't act up because they want attention. Children act up because they need attention. So instead of giving a child time out, give them time in. Bring them into you. Let them sit with you. Let them hang out with you. Let them be in the same room with you. Get them regulated. Turn on their oxytocin. Help them feel safe. 
containment, reducing the space that they have to feel, that they have to feel threatened in. All these things connect back to the brain. That's, that's what's so important. All of these things connect back to regulating the brain and turning on oxytocin. These are my principles of trauma-informed care. Actually, I collaborated with Dr. Bridgewater on these, and you guys have this sheet. You were given it when you came in today. And this is our, Trisha and I came up with the four, the four-point trauma-informed daily checklist. You can utilize this, whether parent or teacher or professional, every day, make copies of it. You can utilize this every day when you wake up. You take three or four minutes and just go through and check, literally check off awareness of self. I'm aware of my breathing. I'm aware of my thoughts. I'm aware of my feelings. I have been charged with the care of a sensitive child. I am seeing him or her, them in my mind at this moment. It's an exercise to bring you more mindful into the moment. Just following this checklist will make a difference just to get present. Awareness of self and others, physical and psychological safety. Children have to be able to feel safe in order to heal. If they cannot feel safe, if they stay threatened, they're gonna to continue to be stressed. Predictability and authenticity. Children have to have predictability. They have to have, predict we all have to have predictability. If we don't have predictability, our brain stays on alert and they need us to be authentic. If you put a smile on your face, but inside you want to grab the child by the neck and wring their neck like a crazed chicken, that is not authentic. They realize it. They interpret it. It makes them feel uneasy. It makes them feel stressed. It's all emotion. Their brains are picking up on your brain. It doesn't matter the kind words you use. It doesn't matter the softness of your voice, the politeness that you use, the 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 the. the you know that it's just yucky, and you know, Eddie Haskell kind of, hello, Mrs. Cleaver. It's so fake. Your children know it. It is better for you to be, to say, I am, I'm pissed at you right now. Just leave me alone. Just give me a freaking break because I have had it up to here with you. They rather have that than have you go, Yes, honey. What do you want now? What can I do for you? Because that's not predictable. That's not predictable. When it's not predictable, it makes them feel more threatened. When you're just authentic and you let them know where you're at, you can be mad. It's okay to be mad. We all get mad. We all get stressed out. Parenting is difficult. Living, adulting is difficult. No one's being perfect here. We all get stressed out, but it's what we do after. It's our ability to repair. It's our ability to apologize. It's our ability to come back because that's our responsibility. Our responsibility as adults, our responsibility as parents is to be able to recover and come back and say, okay, honey, I'm sorry I was a little upset earlier. I just didn't know what else to do in that moment. Now I'm here. I apologize. Let's talk. That's our responsibility. A helping and supportive environment. You got to let children do what they can, but be available to help. Be available to support when it's needed. The emotional flexibility is so important. When we're stressed, we become emotionally rigid. Emotionally rigid. We become emotionally constricted in stress because stress causes constriction. Stress causes survival. We've got to be emotionally flexible. Emotional flexibility allows your children to be able to have their emotions and you not be overwhelmed by it. And then autonomy and respect, allowing children to have more control. Bruce Perry says children have to have a modicum of control because control, again, gives us predictability. And we all deserve respect. Creating a therapeutic environment is just a couple of things for parents. Mindfulness, understanding the dynamic of stress and fear, emotional flexibility and matching of emotions. Awareness, affection, and attunement, being aware of where the child is, all these things require regulation. You can't do any of these things if you're not regulated. If you're not calmed down, if you're not more present, you can't be aware. You can't demonstrate affection. I have a little technique called 10-20-10. This is so powerful. It's so powerful. I don't care what the severe behavior is. If you'll do 10-20-10 for the next two weeks, you'll see a 50% reduction in your child's negative behavior. It's very simple. 
You give the child who's got the most difficult behaviors 10 minutes of quality time and attention first thing in the morning, 20 minutes first thing in the afternoon when they get home from school or you get home from work, and 10 minutes in the evening. That's all you got to do. You do that for two weeks consistently, you'll notice a 50% reduction in the most severe behavior. Most simple thing you can do. I've seen it happen time and time and time again. But what happens is it's affection. It brings affection present. It brings attunement present. That's the dance between the parent and the child. It brings awareness present. Three-phase intervention setting effective limits, all very important. These, a, lot of this, a lot of these things, you can, you can get more information on our website, on my YouTube videos. Like I said, join me on Facebook. I'm always talking. I, I can do something every single day on Facebook. Repetition is so important. Repetition is so important. You have to challenge the paradigm that you have grown up with. The only way you challenge that is through repetition. You have to learn constantly. I eat, breathe, and sleep this stuff, and I've been doing it this way for 18 years. 18 years because for two years I, I, didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. I just walked around in the dark. But you have to have repetition because otherwise what will happen in your brain is as soon as you become stressed, you go back to old patterns, imprints. That's why we forget things so quickly, right? I, I just want you to take three things from today. Three little, three little tips. I don't want you to try to take the whole day. I just want you to take three little tips, and I want you to go out and share them and talk about them and, and try to remember them and try to think of them and, and, and try to interact them, try to engage them. Just three little things because any more than that, you're just going to forget it. I don't want you to forget it. Let's talk a little bit about school. Again, go back to the brain. The most important part of, about school helping children be successful and learning effectively in school is getting them regulated. In times of stress, our thinking processes are confused and distorted. Our short-term memory is suppressed. I can't tell you how important that is. That, 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 just that little scientific finding created a revolution in my brain. In times of stress, our thinking is confused and distorted. Our short-term memory is suppressed. What that means is that when a child is stressed out, they're in their amygdala and their brain stem. That means they're in their surviving, their reacting state of their brain. This is how we achieve educational success with difficult children. The first thing you have to do is you have to realize when a child is in their surviving, reacting, they're in their amygdala and their brain stem, they cannot learn. Fundamentally, they cannot learn a thing. All memory is shut down. All thinking is held hostage. Call this an amygdala hijacking. They've been hijacked by their amygdala. When your amygdala has hijacked your brain, you're in a purely emotional state. So the first thing you have to do is you have to attend to that state. And a lot of times, the way you attend to that state is just getting quiet and creating some safety, some space for the child. You don't have to do anything more than that. So a lot of the things that I'm telling you guys are really just just the, the underlying the underlying denominator of them all is to just get quiet and calm and stress. That's like such a big part. And that's like the most difficult part, the challenge that we have with any of it is just getting quiet and slowing down, calming yourself down. As soon as you calm yourself down, your thinking comes online, your short-term memory gets activated. You realize the child isn't that big of a threat. You realize that what they're doing in this moment is not life or death. You realize that you've been through this before. You're going to get through it again. So you all have the ability to do that in the moment if you just calm yourself down. So attending to the child's survival and reacting is number one. Then you get to the hypothalamus. This is the reacting state. This is this is the responding. So it's half responding, half it's half red, half blue, because it's still real amygdala agitated, but the calming begins because when you can get the child to make eye contact with you, when you can get the child to stop throwing the desk and just start huffing and puffing, when you can get the child to just lay their head down on the table and just be mad or just turn and, and fold up and, and sew up. When you can get the child to, to run out of the room and go out on the playground and let you follow them by 20 yards, that's up to the responding stage. See, now their brain begins the process of coming online. But up until that point, when they're throwing the desk, when they're yelling and screaming, when they're calling everyone a, a dirty dog, they ain't learning. They ain't hearing nothing. They're in survival. So you using your words in that state is just making it worse. I'm going to say that again. 
You using your words, you telling a child to stop, you telling a child to calm down, you telling a child that they're safe when they are in their surviving and reacting state is just going to make it worse. And you sure don't want to touch them because touch is one of the biggest sensory pathways that we have. So you don't want to touch them because they're already overwhelmed. A child who's stressed out can't make eye contact with you because eye contact is the most direct way to stimulate the frontal brain. It's too stressful. That's why children stop making eye contact. They don't. They can't look at you. It's not that they don't want to. They can't look at you. It's too stressful. So you get them to start to make that shift. They move from responding. Then they move up to the hippocampus. They start processing. That's where the child has calmed down significantly. That's where you can talk to them softly. Sometimes you can talk to them firmly. It's not always about talking to a child softly. I'm rather hard, to be honest with you. I'm rather hard because I understand stress and fear. So I can say to a child, what the heck is going on? What is this really about, dude? Does it really have to be like this? And they'll respond to me. Now, there are other situations where I don't raise my voice like that because I've got to match the child. If the child's too agitated, I don't raise my voice. I keep my voice down. I say, dude, we're not going to do this right now. But sometimes, yeah, I'm loud. But it's all about where it's coming from within me. What is the vibration I'm sending? Is the vibration I'm sending one of love and passion or is the vibration I'm sending one of stress and fear? Until you can get to that place, you probably just need to keep your voice down. Get them up to processing. Maybe they'll talk to you. Maybe they won't. Maybe they're just quiet, but they'll listen. You can put your hand on their back, and then you move them up to thrive and integrate. Now, that may not happen until the next day. See, this doesn't all have to happen at once. You have a bad situation at school. It could just be a bad day. Just write off the whole freaking day. Just leave the whole freaking day alone. Just write it off. Say to the child, you know what? Put your stuff away. We'll deal with it later. We're not going to worry about it. This helps you as a teacher as much as it helps you, helps the student, because you're removing the stress. The, and, and see, the first thought that pops in your head is, well, all the kids are going to get mad and not want to do their work. No, they're not, because they're 70%. The 70%, they're happy to be at school. They don't want you talking to them. They don't want you touching them. They don't want you talking to them. They're happy to just do their work. But that 30% child, that's something different. Right off that day. And when you write off that day and you take away that threat, guess what you do? You anchor in a little bit more relationship. You anchor in a little bit more relationship. You anchor in a little bit more safety. You anchor in a whole lot more love. And when that child comes back to school the next day, Bruce Perry says, our brains, our brains always return to the way the event was handled the last time. Our brains always return to the way the event was handled the last time. So if you if you just say to that child, you know what? Let's forget about work today. Let's forget about schoolwork. Let's for, no, no homework. No homework. Leave your stuff here. We'll deal with it tomorrow. They go home. They calm down. They come back. And you know what they come back? You know what their brain goes back to? It goes back to how you just dealt with it the day before. They feel a little safer. They feel a little calmer. They feel a lot more loved. So then when it's time to go to work, guess what they're going to do? They're going to be at thriving. They're going to be at integrating. Now they're ready to go to work. We don't have to compound children's stress. We do that when the next day they come back and we punish them. See, they come back the next day and we punish them. We give them some kind of consequence because we got to teach them something. You ain't teaching them nothing other than the fact that you're a threat. That's all you're teaching them. That you are the threat because as soon as you stress them out, their short term memory shuts off and they're not thinking about what it was that they did. All they're doing is focusing on you as the threat. Creating a trauma informed environment in school, self and other mindfulness is very important for teachers. Accurate assessment. I don't know why we will wait weeks into the beginning of school before we do IEPs. That makes no sense to me at all. If a child is in need of an IEP, the teacher needs to know it before school starts. 
Because there's a whole lot of relationship building. There's a whole lot of safety and a whole lot of security that needs to be getting created in, in that child's life, which is now your child when they come to that school. Waiting weeks until school has started is too late. Everyone needs to know who the trauma-sensitive children are, the stress-sensitive children. Everyone in the school needs to know who the stress-sensitive children are. That's accurate assessment. Attunement. Just paying attention to the child. That particular child, out of 10 kids, out of 30 kids, you probably got three that are particularly stress sensitive. Occasionally you'll have five, but usually you have three and usually you've got one. One who's really sensitive and the one gets the other two stirred up and the three can disrupt the whole classroom. So invest your time in the one. There's one. There's one. And the other two are a little, a little more, a little less sensitive, but that one will get those two stirred up and they'll all disrupt your whole class. Invest in the one. That's the two. Pay attention. Emotional and physical containment. Emotional containment is keeping the child close. Emotional and physical containment. Put the child up to the front of the classroom. Keep the child out of big groups. In the cafeteria, let the child sit behind the, the teacher's table on the playground. Give the child one area of the playground, not the whole area of the playground, because that's containment of the physical environment. When you contain the physical environment, you reduce the space the child can feel threatened in. People are always like, well, Brian, well, you know, what about what about consequences that are good? Well, there, there are consequences in life that are called natural consequences. They're called natural consequences because you can't create them. Anything else is a, is a parent formulated consequence, but the way you use love in a, in a in the way you use love and responsibility in a consequence is like when you go to the grocery store. So if you take your child to the grocery store and you go in the grocery store and you say, "Hey, get in the basket, you little thief," because you like to steal, and I'm not gonna have you stealing, so you get on in the basket. Well, that's fear and that's shame and that's stress and it's embarrassing. See, that's fear based consequence. But if you go to the store and you say to your child, hey, honey, I know when we come to the store, it can be really stressful. So instead of letting you run all around the store, I'm just going to have you get in the basket because that way I can keep you safe or keep you more regulated. And then you won't put things in your pocket that don't belong to you because you only put things in your pocket that don't belong to you because it makes you feel better. Because children steal because it is self-soothing behavior. I'm going to have you get in the basket. Now, I know you're 15 years old. <laughs> so Brian Post said at the conference yesterday, if your child is 15 and they want to get in the basket, let them get in the basket. Because emotionally, they are not 15. Structure routine, very important time in. Mentoring, giving the child an older child that they can connect to. Phone calls to the parents are so important. I don't know why schools don't do this more with these with the challenging children, with the stress sensitive children. Just just as long as home is safe, let them call the mom or the dad midday and mid afternoon, or have the mom and dad call the child and just say, "Hey, how you doing? I love you. I miss you. I hope you're having a good day. Is everything going okay? I'll see you after school." You know, some foster children go to school and they don't know that they're going to have a home when they get out and when that bell rings. They don't know. Some adopted children are the same way. Some of these children have been moved from so many homes, they don't know. How is a child supposed to learn if they go to school in the morning and they don't know if they're going to have a home in the afternoon? They're not. They're not going to learn. So we have to create some security and some safety for them first. Create that, we'll get their learning on track. We'll get their learning moving in the right direction. Simple phone calls, physical contact. I love for a teacher just to do a drive, call them doing a drive-by. You just drive by the child and just kind of brush them with your hand, hit them on the shoulder, pull their ear, pinch them on the arm, just give them a little pat. Kids love it. And what it does is it resets the window of tolerance. Remember when you were in school and you'd be doing your homework, probably cheating. I know some of you were cheating because I was. And, and the teacher walk up right beside you and you just like, like, you got super focused. Just for no reason. Unless you were cheating. Then you were like, hoping you were hiding your stuff. You get super focused. Physical presence and physical context the same way. It just pulls the child back into their window of tolerance. Parental inclusion, including the parents, and obviously homeschooling. Some children need to be homeschooled. Also gave you another sheet. This is not for everyone, but for some of you it is. Because you're interested in learning more, knowing more, being more, doing more. It's this little sheet right here. It's my private membership. Um, it's a, we have a private Facebook members group. It's also a membership site. You get my 16-week master parenting coaching course, my trauma-informed certification course. 
So if you want to get a certificate in trauma informed, then there's a whole course for that. Um, you get access to the private Facebook group where I'm on there all the time. I do monthly live Q and A's, do guest expert interviews, do my how to heal the attachment challenge, anger and the fat child, 18 day course. You get a video every single day. This is all for giving you more repetition. It gives you access to a five two day presentation. Pretty much everything I do now goes on this membership site, and you get access. This is lifetime value. You get interviews, so it's, it's a lifetime membership. And we do, a, it's just like one price, $297, and you have access to me and that forever. So you've got that sheet. There's a website on there if you're interested. Focus on healing because healing allows you all the mistakes you need to make. So go out there and give it a shot. Expect to mess up. Look at it and try to see the fear. Try to see the stress. It's there. I always advise you and recommend that you go out and screw up as fast as you can. The reason I want you to do that is because I want you to turn into an investigator. I want you to go out and screw up. I want you to go home and hope that your child lies to you. Hope that your child is defiant. Hope that your child has torn something up. Because I want you to look at the situation and I want you to say, what is he stressed about right now? What is he afraid of right now? And I want you to let that be an opportunity to transform your relationship because it can happen. I had a mom came to a lecture of mine once. And I taught the three phase intervention, which is reflect, relate, and regulate. Anytime a child is acting out, the first thing you got to do is stop and reflect, take three to 10 deep breaths, calm yourself down. You relate, get in touch with your fear, ask your child how they're, how they're feeling. They're probably afraid, angry, whatever it may be, and then you start to regulate. So she said, I went home. She emailed me two weeks later. She said, I went home. I'd always been having problems with my nine-year-old daughter taking a shower every single night. My daughter would rebel and talk back and yell and scream. It's been a battle like that for five years. Five years. It's been a struggle for my daughter to take a shower at night. So I listened to your presentation and I went home. It was time for a shower. So I thought this time I'm going to be really calm. I'm going to be real calm. I was breathing. I went up and I said, honey, it's time to take a shower. Sure enough, she started talking back just like she always does. But this time I said, honey, if you need anything, I'll be right there. She said, my daughter went and got in the shower. That was the easiest she'd gotten in the shower in five years. But sure enough, she called me once she got in there. Mom, I dropped the soap. Mom, the water's too hot. It's too cold. I don't like the shampoo. She said all the normal stuff she always does that usually frustrates me. But she said, this time I went in, I got what she needed. And I said, honey, if you need anything else, I'm going to be right here. She said, I just sat right there in the bathroom with her. She said, that's the best shower we've had in five years. So I thought I'd go for a home run. Mm -hmm. So my daughter gets out of the shower, still has a towel wrapped around her. I went and I sat on her bed. I said, honey, sit down beside me. She said, I wrapped my arm around her. I said, honey, what scares you so much about taking a shower? And she said, well, mom, the guy who molested me made me take a shower with him. And mom said, honey, you don't have to take a shower anymore. You can take a bath. And she said, my daughter gets in the bathtub so fast now, I don't even realize it. Five years, five years for a parent to just get to the place, to just have the understanding to just ask their child, and she knew about the molestation when the little girl was four. They knew about all that. But it took five years before she, she had the understanding to just ask, honey, what scares you so much about taking a shower? And just like that, it was transformed. All of us have the ability to do that. All of us have the ability to slow down and listen and pay attention. In any given situation, in any given experience, we all have two choices. We all do. We can continue to react from our same imprints of fear and stress and overwhelm, and we can do what the generations have informed us to do. We can keep operating out of that old paradigm, or we can stop, we can slow down, we can take some deep breaths, and we can choose love. And I hope you all will choose love. <coughs> God bless you, and thank you for being here.
week today, um, we are going to have a raffle drawing. So if you would open up your notebooks, you'll have, hopefully you've probably seen it, a ticket. And I'm going to draw one of the tickets. What we're giving away today, Dr. Post has donated one of his books. So that's one of the items you would be receiving, the From Fear to Love. Also, a four DVD set called Family Centered Regulatory Therapy for Attachment, Challenge, Adult, Child, and Family. And then the third thing that you would receive is a book called The Forever Child. And it was written by, um, the parenting guide is written by Dr. Post. And it's a tale of loss and possible dreams to uh, guided books to use for children. Okay, so everybody's got their tickets out. Okay, the winner is 294212. You may have to draw a couple times. Okay, how about 294213? No? 294163. I'm just going to keep drawing until someone jumps up. <laughs> 294137. <laughs> 294239. Yay, you have a winner. Come on up. <laughs> uh, Dr. Tricia Bridgewater asked me to just have a couple closing remarks and um, I, I just the reason you all are here today is because you do love this community and you do care and so I just want to thank Dr. Post and uh, Tricia let's have another round of applause for them so, it's been so many hours that I put into this but because they care because you guys care so thank you guys so much for coming so have a great evening That's funny. Okay, yeah, I get this. Okay.